see it, but it's right there. So just ask your questions into the microphone. Um, and then um, we'll also have, um, that's the same place where you'll line up for the signing line after the event. And once it concludes, if you can just fold up your chairs um, and lean them against something sturdy. Um, tonight, I am honored to welcome Claudia Acevedo Guignones um, to discuss her book, The Hurricane Book, which pieces together the story of her family in Puerto Rico using a captivating combination of historical facts, poems, maps, bits and pieces of overheard conversations and fragmented um, anecdotes. Organized around six hurricanes that passed through the island with varying degrees of intensity between 1929 and 2017, the Hurricane Book documents the myriad ways in which colonialism, particularly the relationship between the U.S. and the island, has seeped into the lives of Puerto Ricans, affecting how uh, they and their land recover from catastrophe, as well as how families and citizens are bound to one another. Claudia Acevedo Quinones uh, is a writer from Puerto Rico. Her work focuses on questions of origin, uh, etymology, oh, and dreams, and um, dis, uh, diaspora. Her poems and short fictions have appeared in the Brooklyn Rail, Wildness, Ambit Magazine, Radar, Poetry, and other publications. In 2019, she was a finalist for the Philip Booth Poetry Prize and uh, that was judged by Mary Rufel. Uh, she was also the runner-up for the Split Lip Press's 2020 Hybrid Chatbook Contest, and she lives in Brooklyn, New York. She will be in conversation with Patricia Corral Ayala, um, who is a bilingual Puerto Rican writer and former director of events here at Politics and Pro. She was my boss, um, although she'll deny that. Um, she holds an MFA in creative writing from American University where she served as the editor-in-chief of Folio and she writes creative nonfiction fiction poetry but frequently her words uh, find themselves home in between all of that um, she is the recipient of the the Myra Skullru award and her work has been featured in fireside fiction literal magazine Houston Public Media, and Grace and Gravity, among others. And her memoir is forthcoming in March 2024. So uh, first, Claudia is going to come up and read for a bit, and then Patricia is going to join her in conversation. So please welcome to Politics and Prose, Claudia Acevedo Quinones. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here on a Friday. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start uh, by reading the first poem in the book. It's titled House Key. Um, I wanted to create a sort of like mythological map of Daino deities. For those of you who don't know, Dainos were um, the inhabitants of Puerto Rico when the Spaniards arrived in the 1490s. House Key. Yaya, the extreme vital principal, killed his own son, Yayael, for fear of losing his kingdom. He kept his son's remains in a guido basket, which hung from the ceiling of his bolillo, a basket stolen by Deminan Caracaracol, who knew the secret to making cassava, secrets he learned from Bayamonaco's spirit of fire, who, upon hearing about the theft, spit on Caracaracol, which produced Caguama, the turtle. Caguama, mother of Arawaks, turtle mother, whose meat fed this side of the Antilles, whose orphaned children cried along the river banks and made coquis spring from hungry frogs. Then Yukau Bagua Maucorote, Yokahu Yukiyu, god of cassava and the sea, he who has no father, he who has no desire, he who watches over men and women, he who has no other purpose, whose mother Atabe, goddess of the moon and fecundity, oversees the flowering of the earth and the harvest with him he whose likeness in stone nurtures the seed. Then Guaban Six, woman storm, goddess of winds and hurricanes, who with her two assistants, Guatauba, gatherer of rains and lightning, and Cotrisque, gatherer of waters, destroys conucos when the people in them have not rendered the tribute due to her image. Boriqueng, land of noble lords, is prone to disasters. Okay. 
And I'm going to read two short um, autobiographical uh, fragments, vignettes. They're about my grandparents, my maternal grandparents. They're featured prominently in the book because I spent most of my childhood with them. This one's titled Olds Oldsmobile. Abuelo, my name for Abuelo Pedro, drove a blue 1984 Oldsmobile Cutlass Sierra with a baby blue velvet interior. It smelled like cigarettes, Agua Maravilla, and pomade. He'd ride in it with the windows down and the radio on, leaning back on the seat as far as possible, with one liver-spotted hand on the wheel and the other holding a lit Marlboro Red. Sometimes there would be a Coors Light in the cup holder. Coors Light is basically water. The easiest parent to spot at school pickup was my grandfather. He would always be there waiting or just putting, pulling up to put out his cigarette on the sidewalk at 2.10 p.m. sharp. If for any reason he couldn't make it on time, he'd call the principal's assistant and ask her to tell me his ETA over the classroom intercom. For 10 years, I could count on him being there to pick me up. Thin, wiry, pockmarked, annoyed, impeccably dressed, uninterested in socializing with the rich mothers he barely tolerated. There were Range Rovers and Hummers everywhere then. My classmates wore Tiffany Charm bracelets. That was Guaynabo in the 2000s. Buelo was a relic. I liked to pretend he was my chauffeur father, like in Sabrina. He'd load up my rolling backpack and ask about my day. I liked watching the dusk and smoke poof, poof up from the velvet whenever I punched down on the seat for emphasis. He indulged me, but wasn't a big talker. He didn't believe in entertaining children. Sometimes we'd go to the market on the way back to his and Beba's house, sometimes to the Agencia Ipica to bet on horses, sometimes to play dominoes with his friends, sometimes straight home. His way of showing up involved minimal coddling, but for all his hardness, he was always surrounded by flowers. He grew orchids in the semi-exposed garage. He tended to pink and red roses, saved the pink ones for me, and removed the thorns. He treated my chronic ear infections with aloe from the garden. Time for another similarly? Okay. So this one is titled Half Moon. Neither Beva nor my mother went to beauty salons. My mother's reddish brown hair went gray in her 30s, so she'd go to her friend Letty's to get her hair dyed Revlon Burgundy every six weeks. Beva went to a woman down the street whenever her perm needed a refresh. She wore a perm until shortly after Buelo died. She didn't get wrinkles until shortly before she died. When strangers at the mall or at parties asked her about her skincare routine, she said it involved washing her face and body with unscented dove bars and removing makeup with Ponce Scream. Y yeah. She did her nails herself. In pictures taken from the 1950s through the 1980s, everything from her cuticles to the beginning of her nail plates, the lunule, the Latin word for little moon, was silver. The rest was red. She called all nail polish cutex an all nail polish remover cutex. I was supposed to know which one she meant when she asked me to fetch it for her. Cutex was the first company to release commercial nail varnish in the 1910s, but it wasn't until the 1920s and 30s when movie stars like Clara Bow and Norma Shearer pop popularized manicures that it became more acceptable for housewives to wear color on their nails. Leaving the little moons bare or painting them a whitish color meant you could go, go longer without having to reapply. Showing the world your moons were white also meant that you didn't have to work much with your hands. But Beba worked with her hands all day. There was a weekly menu. Monday was chicken, spaghetti, and potatoes. Tuesday was chicken and yuca. Wednesday was beef, steak, and rice. Thursday was rice and pigeon peas. Friday was chicken and Coca-Cola and yams, maybe pineapple cake. There were sauces to mix. There were rubs. There was recao. On weekends, she didn't cook, but there was always a school uniform that needed mending, always something to sweep, shoes to polish, things to disinfect. Maybe this is why she spent so much of her downtime on the porch filing her fingernails or painting them. I'd sit in the rocking chair and ask stupid questions. She'd nod or shake her head and laugh, gliding the Revlon peachy pink she graduated to in her older years down her nails like she'd been doing it for centuries, layer after week old layer. My mother and I share a skin peaking dis disorder, dermatillomania, which is in the obsessive com compulsive spectrum. This repetitive and voluntary need to right or wrong might be linked to my mother's compulsion to immediately dispose of any trash containing chicken bones or pull out brown bits of grass and pick up every fallen leaf from her lawn nightly or brush her teeth so hard she loses enamel by the day. 
It might explain my need to immediately clean up after a party, rewrite the to-do list when I've crossed one thing out, tweeze every single ingrown hair on my bikini line. We pick at our cuticles until we bleed while driving, watching TV, talking on the phone, thinking. When I saw her ridged yet painted nail beds, surrounded by rawness on all the fingers wrapped around the steering wheel, I asked her, ashamed for her, why she would hurt herself like that. Imitame lo bueno, she'd say. Basically, do as I say, not as I do. When I first noticed my own mangled nail ridges in high school, I had no idea how they got there. I think that's, that's it for now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much for reading a little bit of the book. I'm very excited, and thank you all for coming. I'm very excited about this book today, um, tonight. I've read it, and it's just amazing. You have to read it. At the same time, I'm very excited because, as we mentioned, I'm also Puerto Rican, and the, we, our stories are rarely told. So having the opportunity of seeing our stories and the personal, the history, the political, um, be uh, so beautifully written is just like amazing. So I'm personally very excited to be here with you tonight and thank you for the book you've written. So speaking of the book, I think probably my first question will be like, what, motivate, what motivated you to write this book? Um, in general, what 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 was that Im that impulse, creative impulse, or instinct, or how this started to be? Um, I started thinking about it uh, when I was in college. I moved to the states in 2006 to go to school, and I had been in the states for three years when I had I was faced with like the, I have to like write a thesis, and. Um, I decided to, I was doing nonfiction at the time, so I decided to write this like historical account of my maternal family's um, journey from Spain to Puerto Rico. And, and then after I wrote the, the thesis, it only had to be 30 pages, I abandoned it. Um, and then in 2017, I was in grad school. Um, and I'd been working on a series of poems about hurricanes when Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico. And at this point, I had been away from home for 11 years. Um, and I was living on the beach in the Hamptons, this beautiful bubble out there, um, while the island I was from was going through something horrific. Um, so I started thinking about that and how my leaving is related to my family's leaving. Um, and then that led to more hurricane poems. Um, and then I somehow ended up like <laughs> writing this. I was interested in, in, I wanted to examine my feelings of guilt around mm -hmm. my not being there mm -hmm. um, and also explore how the hurricane was actually like affecting the island and how it affected us, um, those who were there and who, those who weren't, because uh, I felt so distant. I think this was my way of staying connected. Um, I'm sure there are many other reasons. <laughs> it just felt like, um, like, it felt like obligatory. It just mm -hmm. came out, so I had, I had to do it. Yeah. No, that's amazing, and I, and I think I completely relate in many ways. Um, I think there's n there was for for us right our, our generation or or I don't know people that have been outside of the island when Hurricane Maria happened. I think it was such a I don't know almost like a before and after in the history of of Puerto Rico uh, and our experiences. So I do think that in a way like it really made us question and wonder about our identity and why why are we not there maybe or in which way we can definitely stay connected um this book is amazing i've said it but i mean it um and <laughs> not only because of the things that the book is is writing and the way that she writes that is just beautiful but also the book is has a lot of pictures it has um 
um, you know, like in a way like maps and it also has like um, family trees, like so many things and with poetry and then narrative and then like historic sections. Like in a way I wonder um, why this format that it's so hybrid that in a way like it's taken for s from so many traditions of writing from, you know, chronicle and also essay and also poetry and also um, in a way almost journalism. Like why, why this was the format that you felt you had to tell this story in? I'm deeply insecure. So <laughs> I think that um, in, in some ways I, I use poetry to work through that. Um, but then this hybrid form ended up, even though it was difficult at first, it ended up being perfect for it because I am not comfortable voicing my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, I need to consider all the outcomes. I need to consider all the sources or as many as I can before I feel confident enough mm -hmm. to say something. Mm -hmm. And even then, like I feel like the book also doesn't give people many answers. It's more like, here's this, here's that, here's this. It's more like a collage. I'm like trying to give you as much information as I possibly can. Because um, I'm also trying to look for as much information as I possibly can. Um, I think the way to talk about something is by asking questions and going approaching it from many different angles mm -hmm. as opposed to trying to come up with a conclusion because mm -hmm. I don't know that that's mm -hmm. that interesting I don't know mm -hmm. that it's actually going to give us an answer or if actually we can find a conclusion or maybe right? there's no conclusion <laughs> and that's the truth of it like mm -hmm. maybe it's yeah and I think that uh, you achieved that in a beautiful way like because in a way as a reader you also feel that you're finding all this information all these bits and pieces that you're also in a way creating the story along the speaker and the writer and it's just amazing. Um, in a way that also makes me wonder like what was the research process because there is so many important parts of our history besides the personal. Um, how was the research process? Um, well I think we were talking about this a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. I, when I decided to write the historical thread I just basically wrote down on a piece of paper um, what I thought the chronological history of Puerto Rico was. Um, and then I would take each thing I thought was a fact or something that was close to a fact, and I would go online and I would research it. And that would lead me to, sometimes it would lead me to articles that would give me the answer. Sometimes it was a Wikipedia article. Sometimes it was a book. Um, so it, it really was kind of like, oh, this is what I think it is. And it was kind of like a fact checking. Mm -hmm. um, and in that research, I found out things that I didn't know about. Like I didn't know, like obviously I don't know the statistics that are in the book by heart. Um, but yeah, it d just led me down different rabbit holes. And then I ended up, it was, it's all bullet points. So what you see is like my work, essentially. I didn't embellish it in any way. Um, so that you could see exactly what I was finding out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. No, that's amazing. And I think something that you do very well with this book that it puts it in such a different category that you really cannot classify it, right? Like it's so hybrid and unique and you can try to find many labels for it, but it's just difficult in general. I think one of the things is like, on one hand, you didn't shy away from sharing the Puerto Rican history that has been constantly erased and rarely discussed. Name it, eugenics, using Puerto Rican women to test appeal, persecution, killing and imprisonment of nationalists, the US Navy bombardment in Vieques, one of an, our smaller islands. How did you make this choice to include these terrible episodes from our history that are rarely talked about? Like not even in the island, we talk about it much. Um, these terrible episodes from our history as a US colony and position them in conversation with your personal experience. I feel like I started with the historical parts mm -hmm. I wasn't trying to tie my family's experience or my personal experience to the um, 
to the history. Like it wasn't that in that order. Mm -hmm. I would choose the episodes, the instances uh, that I thought were important and interesting or lesser known. And then I tried to think about, you know, for example, the part about eugenics and, and testing the pill. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about that decade, mm -hmm. 50s, 60s. Like, where was my grandmother then? Mm. You know, mm -hmm. was she of child uh, bearing age? Um, and then I used, so I was thinking, oh, mothers, what can I say about my grandmother? What do I know about my grandmother? What do I know about my grandmother as a mother? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's how it happened. But I, what's interesting is that it was like surprising that you are able to make all of those connections and that probably like speaks to how colonialism seeps into our lives, mm -hmm. um, that I didn't have to try that hard yeah. to do that. Mm -hmm. um, you take an event, you think of your family. How is my family in this moment? Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of writes itself. Now, and I think that's amazing, and this is a side note. I don't know why just this came to my mind, but I remember a friend that, of course, was like a, a person of color, and she said it's interesting how so many people like track the time, like the timeline of their lives by happy moments. And in a way, I timeline my life with tragedies, and I'm not saying this is the case, but in a way, like I think every challenge that Puerto Rico has gone through, you can definitely now that I'm hearing you, like tie tie them tie it up to you, to your family where your family was, and we're in a way like a small island. And then if we add the diaspora, that it's also very connected. Um, in a way, those moments like have an impact on everyone, right? Like if you in the hur in hurricanes, for example, if you didn't lose your house, probably you know someone that did, right? So in a way, we're so like merged to each other and his each other's like personal stories. Um, speaking of personal stories, which as we know, the personal is political. <laughs> um, the book touches on the complexities of patriarchy, mental health, sexual objectification of women, alcoholism. Do you think colonialism plays a role in our personal and romantic relationships in the air in, in the island, like in a way do you think it, it influences in any any way? That's something that I'm still trying to figure out mm -hmm. myself. I mean, the act of loving someone in a heterosexual mm -hmm. partnership is sort of a colonization. <laughs> um, <laughs> when we're talking about people who maybe haven't deconstructed patriarchy yeah. fully, which I think a lot of us, that's a lifelong mm -hmm goal yeah. <laughs> um, yeah I think there is an element of that in most mm -hmm. um, heterosexual relationships under patriarchy mm -hmm. um, there is a colonization of the body mm -hmm. that goes that and it, and it can happen anywhere mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if it can happen in, in the in the colonizers land and it can happen in the land of the colonizer mm -hmm. but I do think that that the fact that a place isn't free, mm -hmm. the fact that even though they are a citizen, they don't have a voice, mm -hmm. a, a voting representative, mm -hmm. um, looking out for their rights, that does something mm -hmm. to a place. Whether it's insidious or, or not, it, it definitely d does something. Mm -hmm. The access to healthcare, for example, um, it's very difficult to get good healthcare anywhere, mm -hmm. but um, in the States, obviously, but it's even more difficult in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. They get less money, th less federal aid than Mississippi, for example, which is like the poorest state mm -hmm. um, in continent, the continental US. Um, so yeah, it, it affects everything. You can't get healthcare, you can't get rehab, you mm -hmm. can't get a therapist, a psychiatrist, um, so many things would change, like so many things about the way we relate to one another and ourselves mm -hmm. are affected by that simple thing. Mm -hmm. And it seeps into every aspect of human life. So yeah, it's pretty, pretty scary. And I think I, I wonder also how much, I mean, again, hearing you like how much the, like where I think we're a culture that are used to 
you know, al aguante, like to endure things. Yeah. And we're raised in a way that you just have to deal with it pretty much. So, so also I wonder like how much of the things we experience, um, we cannot even call it like, I shouldn't be experiencing this, right? Because we're just used to, yeah, that's, that's fine. You're fine. It's nothing. And there's a sense of pride in that mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, not just like politically, economically, also mm -hmm. in relationships. Mm -hmm. um, like mm -hmm. the, way, the, the way we feel we're treated as a citizen mm -hmm. can influence the way that we feel what, what we think we deserve mm -hmm. in relationships. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I do find that a lot of the time, like there's a sense of pride and it's like, I, I went through this, I went through that, and look at me, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, so let's talk about hurricanes. Um, okay. In the books, there are moments where you, the speaker, was waiting for a hurricane with, with her family. Can you elaborate on that experience that it's so common to us? Like, how does it feel? So does it feel when in the island we're, you know, waiting for this hurricane to come? Um, and probably we, we should frame this on the perspective of what we were talking, like uh, both of us grew up in houses that were concrete houses. So in that sense, we have like more privilege over other people. There are other people that don't have the privilege of feeling safe during the hurricane or actually being safe in any way during the hurricane. But in a way like this particular experience right. of- mm. Where you know your roof is not gonna blow away. Mm -hmm. Like you might lose your mailbox, but you're not in danger of losing your home. Um, there is something kind of, um, I mean, we were talking about, I, I, felt, I, I felt kind of terrible saying it, yeah. but I kind of liked the feeling of having to huddle together with my mom and my aunt or my father and, and my step-siblings um, because there was something so scary happening outside. Whatever was happening inside the house didn't really matter as much for eight, 12 hours. Cause you were all just like basically trying to keep it together um, or keep uh, the generator on or something. Mm -hmm. um, you kind of forget about what's going on that's hurting you. Mm -hmm. And you kind of, it's like trauma bonding. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, like I cozy, which is scary, but it's also very sweet. Mm -hmm. Cause you let everything go and you're just playing Monopoly, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> Yeah, and I think I've never read any piece that, I don't know, like put it so well there, like those moments where we're waiting for the hurricane until I until I read this book and even made me think of our own, of my own childhood, you know, like difficulties that we go through where with our families, even, I don't know, even their dysfunctions. And then suddenly you have like the hurricane in a way becomes like some sort of safety blanket and you're kind of protected for a few hours. The irony, that's something that is so destructive, feels like a breather. And, and it happens a lot it too. It happens like a lot. You know it's gonna happen every year, mm -hmm. if not once, twice, three yeah. times. Yeah. No, and, and, and I think that speaks a lot of, you know, the chaotic lives that in a way are lived in the island. I know in many places are lived in different ways, but in a colonized island, I think there are so many things from the daily life that are just chaotic because for starters, you don't have freedom. Um, so in a way like a hurricane can be like a little bit ironically a shelter again for people that grew up in houses like the one that, that we did. Um, I, I'm very interested interested because you you include a lot of hurricanes that went that went through Puerto Rico. I don't know if that's the right verb. I'm sorry. I'm I thinking. Still don't know either. I think it's pass through. <laughs> pass through. Perfect. <laughs> so in a way, like you include a lot of hurricanes that pass through, and as as we know, like at some point you emigrated to the U.S., so the experience of hurricane probably is completely different, or in certain ways, is is very different than in Puerto Rico. Um, I thought it was very interested, it's interesting that you choose to include Hurricane Sandy. Yeah. And I, I'm very curious about the choice. Like in a way, I, I thought, okay, this is part of your experience because now in a way your life has expanded also outside of the island. But I also wonder if in a way it was like some sort of nudge because, you know, like in a way, so many Puerto Ricans live there, so it's almost like an island outside of an island. So I don't know, I wonder about that choice in general. 
My editors also wondered about that choice. <laughs> <laughs> She's there. Um, and I think it was important to include because it was the most, like in my life in the US, that was one of the most destructive ones. Mm -hmm. And it deeply affected Queens mm -hmm. and the Rockaways. And years later, they were still trying to rebuild. In many ways, it felt like the magnitude of Hurricane Sandy mirrored some mm -hmm. of what was happening with Maria. Mm -hmm. um, Rockaways are also a community uh, of a lot of like brown working class people. Mm -hmm. Like you don't find, I mean, other than Patti Smith, you don't find like a lot of mm -hmm. rich people like moving to the Rockaways, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I thought that was important. Also the whole uh, guilt was part of it too. Mm -hmm. I also talk in the book about this, like a lot of my friends um, were activists or teachers um, or neither, they, they were part of the, of, of the reconstruction um, initiative and they were building schools and they were doing all of this for, for the community and I was really close by, I was in New Jersey, mm -hmm. um, but I was, I was dealing with my own mental health issues and I felt like I couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. um, and that feeling of like, feeling like you should do something and you still don't, mm -hmm. Um, is what a lot of my experience as a diaspora Puerto Rican is like. And, you know, guilt is not a useful emotion, mm -hmm. but I spend so much of my time feeling that. Yeah, I don't know why it's so, I guess I'm asking these questions because also I'm, I'm curious. I'm trying to see if I can find the answers through you. <laughs> no, <laughs> you know? I have no answers. I'm the, sorry. the guilt that, that we yeah. carry. And I think probably speaking of Hurricane Maria, I don't know if that was your experience, but I think I've never feel, felt as guilty in my life as looking, you know, seeing so much destruction. I think that was the first hurricane in my life that I didn't like. Um, seeing so much destruction and I was safe from it. You know, I was in Houston at the moment and my family were, you know, back in the island. Um, can you speak a little bit about your experience with that or, or maybe just keep elaborating on, on the guilt and how it felt from like the destruction and also like how the personal life, it's always so ingrained with the political um, every day and, and everything that happens in the island. Yeah, um, I don't really have a very close relationship with a lot of members of my family. Mm -hmm. um, I do speak to my mother often. Mm -hmm. um, and I've always in a way felt responsible for her because we didn't have a very um, typical, I don't know, mother-daughter relationship. Um, and being away from her while she was going through all of these mental health struggles that I talk about a little bit in the book, uh, substance abuse, all of that. Um, that the hurricane really amplified that. The fact that she couldn't, ha like she didn't have access to her medication. The fact that she didn't know the pump was gonna be empty when she got to it mm -hmm. after waiting for three hours, you know. Um, her trying to like preserve battery. Mm -hmm. There's like, there's a powerlessness. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would talk to her and I would worry about, and I would ask her how she was doing. I was like, are you eating? Like, wh what are you doing right now? And she's like, don't worry about me. Like, don't worry about me at all. It's like, a part of me knows, like, I can't move back, mm -hmm. especially not now. Mm -hmm. um, but a part of me is always gonna be like, I should, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Even though my own mother is telling me, like, no, like, you, you keep going. Like, do, do not come here. I do not want you to come here. Mm -hmm. To her, that would have been, um, not a failure, but it would have been me giving up something mm -hmm. that she didn't want to feel responsible mm -hmm. <laughs> for. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the case with a lot of Puerto Rican families of kids who've left. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the, the hurricanes just amplify everything. Mm -hmm. Hurricanes amplify like the the feeling that you're that you're missing out, um, the feeling that you're a bad daughter or a bad mm -hmm. son, mm -hmm. a bad sister, a bad brother. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes it really clear like how 
there's always going to be something missing. Like the farther away you are, the more time you spend away from them, the less information you're going to be able to, to attain and also to even think about your relationship to the island. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that answers your question. At present, at that moment, pretty much shows not to let things come in from anywhere else. And then you realize, well, we are an island. Like that space is isolated. And I think, oh my God, when all of you read this book, you have to read the section on the freaking diet book. Yeah. It just broke my heart. It was so beautiful. I don't know if you want to leave it in suspense so they read or, or if you want to share a little bit about that story. Sure. It's actually related to what I was just saying. I, was, I, I, I had called my mom to ask her how she was doing and um, I asked her if she would eaten anything and she just said, oh, I went to the bar and they didn't have any Diet Coke so I got a couple drinks and then I I told her like okay I'm just gonna send you some Diet Coke mm -hmm. and I, and they never made it in mm -hmm. which is I mean that's what happened for years mm -hmm. and like FEMA would just drop millions of water bottles in a field because they didn't know where to put it mm -hmm. meanwhile there are people who don't have access to water mm -hmm. you know there are people in Puerto Rico who don't know just how bad the death toll was because the government of Puerto Rico would keep it a secret um, or would just like give a random number that was inaccurate and it took months to like the New England Journal of Medicine I think it was mm -hmm. um, gave gave like what is considered to be like the close or it's like more than 4,500 yes. dead um, so yeah, and they sell, and they stay. They only change the the death toll to make it like half of that. It's like the official one is two thousand something, but in reality, all everything has been said. I mean, we are a U.S. territory. We're a colony. We are U.S. citizens, like a territory that belongs to, um, I don't know, the supposedly stronger country in the world. We can debate that. Um, but at the same time, it's like you let more than 4,000 people die. You just let us die there. And it's not just an accident. I mean, the, the hurricane killed, I think, 16 people the hurricane killed. So we are, more than 4,000 was killed by the U.S. government and then also part of it, I would say, also the local government. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Trump say, what did he say? Um, uh, I don't know why we wasted this money. Like, you're not, why are you not grateful? Yeah, you're not grateful. Puerto Rico wasn't on some success. He also said, what else he said? He said that we threw their budget out of work. And he also said that we were not a real catastrophe, like, at three. Yeah. When there are people burying their grandparents in the backyard because they don't have, like, they can't get ambulances yeah. to go where they are. Mm -hmm. um, People writing on their roofs help us. Yes. Um, not a catastrophe. We were not a catastrophe. Yeah. Small island, 100 miles by 35. Yeah, it's not even difficult. In the meantime, we can, you know, they can deploy the army all over the world. They can kill like pretty much every country, but they cannot save citizens. Or even if we were not citizens, they cannot save other people from dying. Um, so. As after all of this conversation, how do one, does one make peace with growing up as a, you know, we kind of bring in as a nationalist, independent political tradition, learning about all the atrocities that the USA has done in Puerto Rico, and now we live in the US. I mean, yeah. Can we ever make peace with that, or how do we make peace with that? No, I can write four more books about that, and I'm <laughs> always going to feel like I've betrayed everything mm -hmm. that my grandfather believed in, that my father used to believe in, like, what my mother believes in. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, I don't think that, that I will come to, that's just something I just have to live with. Mm -hmm. I made the choice to leave, mm -hmm. and I didn't make the choice to leave because of what was happening. Mm -hmm politically in Puerto Rico, which at 2006, the year I left, is when the the tax code that kept um, <coughs> U.S. pharmaceutical companies employing so many Puerto Ricans, um, those, those stopped. And 
that that was the mark of like a huge recession that people are still battling through. Um, I didn't leave because of that. Mm -hmm. I left because of my own like personal uh, home life. I just wanted, <laughs> yeah. I And you know, I remember watching like uh, VH1 documentaries about St. Mark's and I was like, I wanna go there. <laughs> I should go there and I got a scholarship, you know? Mm -hmm. I would have gone to the University of Puerto Rico. I, I, I got in, I, I was either gonna go there or I was gonna go to New York if I got the money. And I got the money and I left. Mm -hmm. And I thought that it, that was gonna be that. And then it became this one decision that has completely messed me up for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. You know, you think like, oh, I'm, I'm 18, I'm gonna have a great time, I'm gonna live my own life. I'm this romantic, you know, like, <laughs> writer, mm -hmm. wannabe, and, and now I'm, I just have to live with that. I have to live with the fact that I kind of went against, um, or didn't go against, but mm -hmm. I'm not fighting for mm -hmm. what so many people fought for, mm -hmm. a fight that I support. Mm -hmm. But that unfortunately becomes like less and less likely mm -hmm. to, to amount to freedom. Mm -hmm. I, com I completely relate. Like in my case, I was going to be out for an adventure of a year and it has been already mine. So I completely understand. And at the same time, you keep, you know, building your life, like making connections, like things just keep becoming more complicated. The things in the island keep becoming more complicated as well. And, and then you have to deal with it and yeah. live with it. So I think, yeah, probably we'll never find peace in that. We'll just learn to live with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, so I don't know, like, um, I don't know if anyone has questions, because I can keep talking, like, for three years here. <laughs> when I think of uh, hurricanes, I think about uh, power outages and... Uh, lose and therefore losing access to water and but also Puerto Rico is blessed in the sense that um, it has all the sunshine and uh, even though it's surrounded by salt water uh, with, with all these new technologies like uh, solar for example um, you would think that uh, there would be more distributed energy uh, where everyone has um, uh, solar on their roof and, and a backup battery and um, as far as uh, water supply um, I come across all these articles about desalination uh, methods and some of them are kind of like do-it-yourself yep. there's also a, a rainforest there mm -hmm. and you can get uh, nowadays you can get uh, water out of air and uh, humid air like from and so that, that would seem to be a good source so, uh, do you see anything happening along those lines? I'm not there, so I can't really say. And I haven't really been through a hurricane on the island. I do think that after what happened, more people are going to be um, figuring out ways to purify. That they're actually quite easy. Like, mm -hmm. you can pick up a book on like bushcraft and primitive camping and and learn all of these things. Um, and I'm sure that that, that that was something that was happening. I also think, in my experience at least, in the city, like, I had no idea when I was little that those things were possible. Like, mm -hmm. we would go to the store before, like, when we knew that a hurricane was gonna pass through, and then we would just get a bunch of, like, bottles of water. Mm -hmm. um, like, we, we don't drink water out of the, the faucet mm -hmm. there. No. Um, and I'm sure that there are wells, I'm sure that, you know, but at least like in, in the suburbs, in the city, mm -hmm. uh, in, coast, in coastal areas, I don't think that that's... Mm -hmm. I, I think it has been, I think definitely here again, I mean, I can add mm -hmm. to that. I yeah. think definitely the Hurricane Maria like um, played a role in making people wonder about these other alternatives. I think we need to put in context that like Puerto Rico is I think more than 40 something percent of the population lives on the poverty level. So um, solar energy, like having like, you know, all of that technology is very costly. And then we, uh, the country in general ha is going through bankruptcy pretty much, not bankruptcy, but you know, it's, it's dealing with all the debt and many other things. Um, 
So I think overall it's costly, many of these options. The other thing is like, yes, I think people started to think about that when when this this year can happen. But the reality is like, we had a lot of rivers, but a lot of people got sick with the rivers. Um, and at the end of the day, it's like DC, for example, we can, can DC stay without power for a year? Um, even though we're surrounded by water, I think no one should be without power and and the basic water needs for so long. Um, at the same time, I do agree that it's important to think of sustainable ways, um, not only because of fear against, but also for, for the planet. <laughs> at least like coming up with better infrastructure for schools and hospitals, mm -hmm. because because there was no power, mm -hmm. all the kids were at home. Yeah. So like you're gonna have less time to take care of, of of your solar or or look look for like alternative mm -hmm. um, sources of, of electricity, um, looking for resources. Also, transportation was really difficult. It was really hard for people to leave their neighborhoods sometimes. Um, and the lines for gas just to get in, yeah, to fill fill their tanks, fill their tanks. Yeah, yeah. It was it was just very difficult. That's why for more than four thousand people. I'm absolutely fascinated with the framework of your book, the way in which you say a natural disaster like hurricanes can literally shed light on something like how a society responds to it, like you were saying, Maria versus Sandy, and that literally shows uh, what is available to one society with the same disaster. And it's funny, it just made me think back 75 years ago, at least historically, that's what the books talk about, when India was under the colonial power of the British, same thing. There would be disasters, you wouldn't know what the death toll was, you wouldn't know what the, and it, it in, included epidemic, you know, any kind of this thing, same thing, you would just wouldn't know the facts. It keeps them empowered. It it's keeps them empowered, them and, and it also, them. it is a question of, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's, it's, it's also a way of, of discounting uh, uh, you know, what really happens there. My question to you is that um, using this, I mean, this is just so unique and the way you have looked at it, um, and don't feel guilty, all of us who have moved away from where our societies are, and it, all of us carry this. And in a way, I think it makes us better people because we are always thinking about solutions and we are always thinking about what can be done. So in a way, it can be for the positive. But my question to you is, do you think that this can um, sort of wake even the people of Puerto Rico? I, I don't mean wake up in the sense we are all awake. It's, it's not that we need to be woken up. But look into new possibilities uh, of Puerto Rico not necessarily being seen only as part of the US, but collaborating with India, collaborating with China, collaborating with other people, whether it's for technology or for development. I mean, looking at it as a, in a way that's saying, well, the solutions are not going to necessarily come from up north only. It can come from other areas. Um, because hurricanes is something that devastates all of our, um, all, all of our you know, locations where we live. Uh, we have hurricanes every year that uh, wipes away fishing villages along the coast of India every single time. So is that something that can sort of uh, be one of the consequences of a book like this? I would hope that there are more books like this and I hope that in Puerto Rico they continue starting independent presses and um, I think that there is a I just heard about that in that article. Yeah. Um, there is like a, an issue of invisibility yes. um, within the island, and I don't think that I don't think that we would be able to make these connections with other countries, other powers, or stop looking to the U.S. Um, when we haven't even looked at ourselves yet. Mm -hmm. um, we are very disconnected from one another. There, there are, but there is like a huge like clash, um, a class division too. Um, and the people who are in power have more information than the people who are not. The people closest to the people in power have a little less.
less information, but more than the people who are living in the mountains. Mm -hmm. um, so it's yeah, I think we have to start with with us uh, telling our stories first. Um, I think that's the way that we can start figuring out how to help ourselves. And yeah, you've made a great beginning there. Oh, it's, amazing. Stories. it's amazing. <laughs> it's really beautiful. I think to that we should add that I think definitely the political situation also does not allow us to make any type of connections, connections yeah. with other countries and that that's one of the things that happened when the hurricane. Other yes. countries other other countries offered help. But then, because we don't own our, our, you know, like our territory, right. this help cannot make it to Puerto Rico the same way we cannot negotiate with other countries. So also part of it, um, I think definitely looking at ourselves, but I think also part of it will be like, maybe after we look at, your, at ourselves, really thinking about other political situations. Yeah. Think about, <laughs> after we look at our relationship to each other, looking at our relationship with the U.S., yeah. Um, that would require undoing uh, 200 years of U.S. Uh, Puerto Rico colonial history. And we tried in the 30s and 40s and 50s and everyone got, everyone went to jail or were killed. So, but, you know, as long as we're alive, that's all we can do. Yeah. Thank you so much, Claudia. Like Thank again, you. this book is amazing. It's very poetic. It's beautiful. It's inspiring, and also at the same time, it has all these historical things that we never read about in most places. So I think it's very important um, to read this book from that aspect, and also enjoy the beauty of, of the personal story of the of your writing. Um, I think it, it just. You just made amazing work here, and I feel so very much. honored to be here with you I today. Too. And I feel like so happy to see like you know you're telling your story, but by telling your story, you're telling our story. So thank you for your work. Um, make sure to get a copy of the book. Uh, Claudia will be here signing, and also not only get it, read it, and get a few more to give away. I think it's very important that people get to know more about these things um, and thank you all for coming and enjoy the so rest much. of your night there, and there is some yeah work. oh and look out for Patricia's book <laughs> <laughs> then I'll, I'll have to bring it and then yeah, we'll talk it. <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you there are some snacks in the bag and please get your copies are in the register and um, Claudia will be signing and thank you again for coming have a wonderful night I'll put the number on the